All right, thanks. So I'm from Berkeley Lab. We have a decent view that there's no fog, I guess. And I'll tell you about our project about gene set summarization using LLMs. All right, well, so I, I wanted to start with this idea that really the hardest thing you can do in research is try to interpret results. And maybe if you're a bio biologist, that's even one order of magnitude worse, or maybe even worse than that. Um, there are lots of reasons for this, you know, lots of data, complex data types, different approaches, uh, legacy data, um, and, you know, we're always pushing the envelope. We have a lot of knowledge we have to collect and standardize, so just at that edge still. On the left, we have an example of RNA-seq experiment, right? Something very standard. We take cells, tissues, perform a series of experimental steps, uh, and then get a, get a set of sequencing reads that tell something about gene abundance or differential expression. And that often results in some kind of gene set, right? You apply a cutoff and get a set of genes. Uh, and so now the question is, what do those genes mean in this experimental context, right, of a specific state or condition? Uh, so now on the right, I have a mystery gene set for you. Uh, maybe raise your hand if you think you know what it is. We'll see you know, how many people can grok this. I can give you more clues. It's from human. That's probably not the right audience, sorry. Uh, okay, so I'll just reveal it. Glycolysis pathway, right, central to life. Um, if I gave you the gene descriptions, maybe that would have helped, but maybe not, right? Uh, and then, you know, we actually more, know more here, right? So we know the individual gene functions. Uh, we know how they link together to perform a series of reactions that take glucose to pyruvate, uh, something that's you know found in many, many organisms, very conserved, right? Uh, but in reality, these gene sets are not that pure, right? They include noise, they have overlapping signals, natural variation, relationships we don't know about, uh, and other, other things, right? So in many ways, it's kind of downhill from this model organism well-known process setting. All right, well, like, luckily, in, in a way, there are lots of tools out there, especially in the context of the gene ontology, to perform analysis of gene sets. So here I took the gene symbols I just showed you, input them into this tool, and voila, we get a series of analysis. Uh, the top enriched pathway is glycolysis here. Let's see if I can figure out pointing. Maybe not. Uh, and there are other pathways that are very close in p-value, right? So some are not informative, metabolic pathways. You probably would reject that. There's HIP1 signaling, that's actually our response to low oxygen conditions and oxic response, so different kind of metabolism. Similar genes involved, apparently. Uh, and so it seems like we've turned the problem of interpreting the set of genes into interpreting a set of other analyses, right? Uh, and that could be okay, but there's no good consensus on what's, what's the best approach, what's standardized here, right? Uh, we have a kind of hypergeometric test, right, that's used very properly, but, but has known biases, other issues. Uh, and also, we don't have a consensus on how to report those results, right? Uh, okay, so we're curious whether LLMs can somehow provide something. Uh, so can they reliably, reliably summarize a set of genes? Uh, now, here you need to realize that standard enrichment sits on a pyramid of, pyramid of prior work, right? So lots of experiments, human creation, ontology construction and maintenance, uh, and generation of reliable annotations. Uh, but if we uh, form this problem as a comparing to standard enrichment, we can, it's a very pointed question, we can evaluate that formally and, uh, you know, give some metrics, I guess. Now, these LLMs can also provide narrative text, right? This is something hard to evaluate. We're also curious whether those summaries, right, could be provided. There is not much else that can do that today. Uh, and then on the right, we have an example of a biological mechanism. This is the uh, human inflammasome involved in, for example, response to you know, microbial infection. And looking at this diagram, you can, you can envision lots of different kinds of gene sets, right? And probably you know, different experts would come up with maybe different subsets of that, depending on their expertise. Um, and there's also some relationships here to look at, right? Uh, OK, so what can LLMs do? Well, this is all still claims, right? So I'm just giving you some recent publications here in this area. The top four are pretty much common knowledge now, right? So just chat GPT or coding assistants, uh, which I think are useful. It seems like they're becoming popular in our day-to-day -day work. Um, then on the bottom, we have something like document summarization, information extraction, and especially that last one uh, is beginning to leverage ontologies and other structured approaches, uh, which I think is maybe changing the game a little bit. And that's something that we're leveraging here in Palisman. 
Uh, okay, so this is maybe along the lines of kind of what Andrew showed us. Um, I just have this simple color scheme for you know, the user input is light orange, LLM response is in highlighted black. Here we're asking GPT-4 to summarize the abstract of a paper of a, about a novel human cytokine. So recent result, very likely not included in training of this uh, model. Uh, and we provide the actual... Okay, sure. And um, okay, maybe this is better. And then we provide the full text of that abstract, right? So this little parameter I'm showing, that's where you paste in this text. And we get you know, a pretty decent summary of the complex biological result that has correlative aspects, that involves different kinds of patients, uh, no, you know, confabulation here. Maybe it's not, you know, well put together paragraph, right? But kind of mild success, right? Uh, so if you wanted to read less, maybe there's there's something here, right? Um, and we can interact with these LMs now, you know, through web API, uh, different kinds of apps. There's different entry points. All right. So for this talk, uh, it's important to note that you don't have to interact with LMs just with free text. You can also include structured data. So now we're asking the LM to summarize that abstract as a table with two columns, concept and value. It's inferred you know, some concepts that are identified uh, in this text and then provided values from that abstract. It's all correct here. You could go one step further to try to standardize the concepts you know, to, from some controlled vocabulary and perhaps similarly with the values, right? Especially if they're numeric, you could do things about units. And then in theory, you could run that at scale in a larger set collection of uh, literature uh, and maybe populate a knowledge base, right? So these structured approaches are beginning to go in that direction uh, to providing us structured data that, of course, you know, still requires creation, other types of checks. Uh, but because you can do things at scale, right, there, there's some advantage there. All right, so this is the Talisman template for the prompt. Uh, I'll just kind of quickly lead you through this. So there are two parameters, one for the taxon at the top, one for gene context data at the bottom. Uh, we have the task that's description at the top along with the one-shot example that essentially gives a pair of genes that have you know, two annotations for related terms that share a parent term, right? And this is just based on human anatomy. Maybe that exact concept is not important here. Uh, there are additional details here about what it should and should not do. Kind of arrived at by trial, trial and error. Uh, so we don't want it to return diseases. So I'll have a little bit note on that in a second. Uh, and then in the middle, we have a section that asks for a structured response, right? So you want a summary with some text, a mechanism with some text, and then a list of delimited terms that uh, you know are some kind of some kind of representation of that uh, overall biological context for what those genes could be doing. Uh, we do have to give additional instructions about the separator and order here. So LLMs like to violate, you know, your rules. It's kind of like a messy assistant, I guess, in a way. Um, and so uh, in order to have stable parsing of the results, right, that's actually an important aspect. Uh, it's probably more work needed on that, actually. Uh, and then on the bottom, we provide the gene context data. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit more detail on that in a second. All right, so this is just an example of that filled in prompt. It's still not the full one because it's too, you know, too big. But yeah, you see a human taxon in there and then your gene symbol at the bottom along with some type of functional description. So in Talisman, we have three different versions of this gene context data. It's actually important also for the evaluation. So really, the talk is about evaluating whether this works at all. Uh, so first, you have just gene symbols alone. Um, for now, restricted to human data. Uh, gene symbols with a concatenated go term description. So this is taking the uh, uh, go term annotations for those genes, taking the description, essentially making this kind of fake paragraph. Uh, not that readable, right, but has uh, good information. Uh, and then the third uh, option here are gene symbols with the recipe narrative paragraph, which is a human curated text that often has broader, you know, synthesized context for the gene, including some things about disease and other stuff that's not in Go, essentially. Now, when we started this just over a year ago, the context windows are small, things were expensive, but now, you know, 200 pages of text, that issue has gone away. So definitely progress in, in that area. All right, so now we'll go through a couple examples of talisman prompt and response. Uh, here we're taking the sensory taxia gene set from HPO. That's a neurological symptom it involves interruption of sensory feedback, a human created set of genes. Uh, we submit the prompt with this gene, uh, input uh, gene context now with gene symbols and the ref paragraph. And we get a response that's, you know, nothing is wrong there. Um, gives you something fairly reasonable. It's actually something interesting in the mechanism where there are three different subsets of those uh, genes from the gene set that share different properties. Um, and these we checked and that that's also looks good. So 
you know, that's maybe something non-trivial that you would get, maybe not even through standard enrichment, right? Maybe the PVLs don't quite work out there. Uh, okay, but what we're really interested in are these uh, list of terms that we get from the, the model. Um, so on the left are the raw strings of those terms. I've highlighted in red actually a hallucination, but it's not really what you think. It's not a factual hallucination. It's a prompt contradiction. We ask for no diseases. We're getting diseases back. We can detect them with an ontology. Um, you know, not the end of the world, right? But good, good to monitor. Uh, and so on the right, we have those terms mapped to ontology terms. We have a mix of ontologies here. Mondo for disease, uh, Go for you know, function process localization, Uberon for anatomy, um, and Mesh for medical terms. Uh, in green are some sequence features and protein families. We're not actually including those classifications. That in theory could be something to improve for this approach here. Uh, so it's interesting to see that. Uh, okay, so now we'll move to a different sets of genes, uh, COVID-19 susceptibility genes, actually sourced from an LLM, so a little circular here. Uh, this is now asking of a earlier model, GPT-3.5. I'm going to skip the narrative text, uh, hard to evaluate, so just as I showed you an example. But now we're getting a list of terms, all of them mapped to GAR term exactly. Um, kind of shocking, right, in a way. Uh, and, you know, this model is trained or not so much on COVID data, so it's early still. Uh, so it doesn't really know about new COVID biology. And so we see lots of terms about, you know, immune response, viral processes, right? Um, also reasonable. Okay, and now if we go to GPT-4, we get a different set of terms. Uh, of course, this is stochastic. We run these in triplicate. You get slightly different answers. That's a kind of different story. But here in blue, I highlighted two pieces of biology for this later model that was released in March 2023. That included a lot more, you know, COVID-19 biology, which is all new, all new things. And so this JAK-STAT pathway and tumor necrosis factor are kind of new pieces of biology, right, that appeared after this GPT-3.5 model. Um, so new information is coming in, and we can get it uh, as summaries for sets of genes. So I think that was an interesting result. But now we're actually getting more terms uh, on the right, which don't map to ontologies, right? So in a sense, that's a little problematic. I'll draw attention to two of these. So this defense response to viruses and bacteria and uh, cellular response to cytokines and polysaccharide, which are actually compositions of two existing Go terms. So the LM here is kind of doing a shortcut. Um, you know, maybe it's being lazy in a way uh, and it's kind of composing terms or, you know, reporting things that we can decompose and detect an ontology, perhaps also suggesting there's information in the parents, right? There may be a missing parent uh, pairing there. So potentially it's giving us some clues about ontology modeling and how, what decisions were made to represent knowledge. Uh, okay, um, I have to maybe speed up a little bit here. So uh, this is now the evaluation. So kind of the core of our paper, you can look at the archive preprint. We start with 70 gene sets from a variety of sources, all curated or supported with very strong data patterns. Uh, we have three different versions of GPT, GPT-3, uh, for three, five, four, right? Going over time. We take the gene symbols from the sets, find their gene identifiers, so standardized identifiers. And that's important for this next step where we create uh, the context data, right? So we can go to another resource, uh, you know, get the go term descriptions, uh, latest annotations, right? Same for the rest of the paragraph. Now the prompts are constructed, submitted to the LM, you harvest the narrative text, uh, and you harvest these go terms and unparsed terms. And now you just do a direct comparison to the same results from standard enrichment. So, you know, hypergeometric with FDR correction, multiple testing correction, and P Valley cutoff. And you look at the results, right? Um, so, the paper has a lot more detail. It's somewhat complex. So, I'm going to kind of skip over and go to the highlights here. Uh, so, this is the first result about the top enriched term occurring in the list of terms from the model. Uh, and uh, you note that, you know, the top case here is pretty good, has some variance. But you know, almost 90% of the time, the top term right is recapitulated in one of those terms in the term list. But the other thing you see is this trend right of the earlier models doing much, much worse, really at the level of random. And now, right, a year and a half later, uh, we're now maybe kind of useful territory. So maybe also hinting a little bit to what Andrew was, was showing us. Uh, the results are actually more complex. Uh, and so we have other ways to summarize this. This is an overlay of the terms from standard enrichment with the bold boxes with uh, talisman uh, terms in yellow that are go, go terms, but are not significant. And on the bottom right, we have these unparsed terms, right? And in some ways those are exciting, but also difficult to deal with. 
Uh, so let's see, I, I'll just mention a couple of things. So the uh, talisman will report certain terms which are not significant, but also not very useful, like biological process. They're not really wrong, right? And so I think some case, some people have been using parent terms to uh, to analyze that. Maybe that, that's an issue. Uh, on the unparsed terms, I'll just point that this myelin sheath maintenance is a term that occurs in the bottom of this uh, diagram that's peripheral nervous system myelin maintenance. So Go has actually composed anatomy with function there. Um, and there's another case of mitochondrial DNA replication similar. There's no term for mitochondrial localization in Go. There is mitochondrial DNA replication, right? And so in some ways, there's this decomposition, composition of terms happening between these two, two systems. Uh, the other thing we did is we compared all these model and data combinations uh, with a non-parametric test, uh, looking at the performance of them across these 70 gene sets and triplicates, and essentially it's the same story. So older models are outperformed, and there are these two cases of GPT-4 with Go terms, GPT-3-5 with just gene symbols that outperform everything else except for each other. And there's really something peculiar about GPT-3-5 where it almost seems like it's better tuned or trained for biology. Uh, so with this minimal information, right, it can actually do fairly well. Uh, okay, so just to end, uh, this is the variability of those term lists that come back from the LLMs. So how consistent or varied are those results? And here, it's actually a fairly sensical result. The latest model with the least data gives you the least variation, right? Um, but at the same time, every model returned pairs of term lists that were completely different, right? So there's, uh, but I guess I'd also highlight, right, that we've, we're seeing progress over time uh, in, in multiple ways, right? So there are multiple views of this that it seemed to be working. Uh, there's a lot of work left to do here. Um, we actually were excited about, you know, kind of informing ontology and introspecting ontology with this. So we're trying to build a UI that shows these two results side by side. Um, you can definitely recognize entities in the pretext, right, and kind of reconcile them with the term list. There may be some gain there. Uh, there is a subset of hallucinations we can detect, like I showed you, right, con con contradiction, maybe one or two others. Uh, and of course, rag with the literature, right, would be one way to additionally validate here. Um, so I have this slide, but I think Andrew just took care of all this. I'll just leave it at that. But we do need lots of openness and access, right? So that's something very important for to, for our funders to know, right, that we need access to these models in multiple ways, both training data, how they're trained, actual access itself. And then, you know, we have to push them to their limits, right? Like this is just an example of an image generator where we try to make, make an image of someone holding an umbrella upside down, and no matter what you did, it was just not possible, right? So you don't know if that's training issue, if that's guardrails or something else. Um, sometimes you want these nonsensical results, right, with, with that data. All right, so acknowledgments, uh, Bebop Group and Berkeley Lab, open source projects, uh, the people involved in Talisman, we have a preprint, uh, we have a GitHub with the data for this uh, analysis and the notebooks. Uh, and then the code uh, repo has a CLI and a Streamlit app and, and more uh, appearing there. All right, thanks, so that's, uh, that's all I got. Thank you for your talk, Martin. We have an online question. Did you okay. try to compare other mo with other models like Claude or Llama? Good question, right? So now uh, through the Ontology Access Kit, we actually have access to a long list of models, so we can go back and, and do that. I, I agree, it's, it's important to include open models. They have been not as performant. Uh, Claude actually is pretty good, but that's another commercial one. Um, but you know, here we actually, what is important was to see the evolution of a model over time. They're not exactly the same, right? But to see that progress, right? Because you know, we are skeptical, but it, at the same time, you don't want to ignore progress and miss an opportunity, right? Yeah, very, okay. very nice talk. Really enjoyed it. Um, I guess one thing I was wondering is, is there an opportunity to include more experimental context in the prompt to get halfway results that may be more relevant? So if you know that the experiment was done in the liver or something like I that, see. then... That's interesting, right? So I guess uh, that could be probably be another whole version of this, right? Where you include any information. If you can include information for papers, that could be a RAG approach. Uh, it's maybe a little harder to evaluate because there the terminology will not be as standardized. Your good term descriptions usually come from a curator, right? Someone has looked at it. Uh, and so there's a broader context that the other terms will be kind of normalized in that, that language, right? Um, so, you know, maybe Maybe just including even concepts, right, from literature would help here. Yeah, very interesting idea. Huh? I'm going to take one last question. So uh, thank you for the very nice presentation. So I'm um, actually uh, slightly related to the last question. Um, have you thought about have you thought about like doing uh, large language model based interpretation and the other way around? So 
Um, so what we so um, our, group, our group have previously tried that we input a question into the large language model, mm -hmm. and then we ask it to output say forty pathways, mm -hmm. and with gene sets, and then we would match the differential expressed genes against those pathways using standard approaches like um, the GSEA, mm -hmm. etc. And then we get uh, the enrichment analysis based on this these relatively small gene set uh, comparing to KG, etc. So. So have you thought about uh, this approach and do you have any comments about that? Because it preserves uh, the statistical power mm. or statistical analysis that we can have with our traditional tools uh, when comparing to just put in um, a list of genes and then ask it to give a qualitative output. So thank Makes you. sense, right, okay. Uh, let's see, so I did use the, uh, the LM to generate the set of COVID-19 human susceptibility genes, right? So that's definitely one. You can generate gene sets pretty easily. I think, you know, in terms of asking the LM to do quantitative things, it's probably out of scope currently. Uh, it does try to fabricate numbers, right? And sometimes they're even ballpark correct, but that's uh, a difficult problem. So I think these hybrid approaches, right, where you, I mean, essentially our evaluation uses, right, standard enrichment on one side. Uh, and you can show those results side by side and show what's maybe novel or missing in the ontology, right? And of course, exposing the hallucination. So I think that's maybe getting close to what you mentioned, right? Yeah, let's uh, think 